Our featured BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charity seal holders for this episode are Virginia War Memorial Foundation, Wayfinder Family Services, Ceres Society for Invertebrate Conservation. To find out more about these and other BBB Wise Giving Alliance accredited charities, go to give.org. You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBgive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. This is the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBgive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving and reports in the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. Today, my guest is a longtime colleague in the nonprofit sector who actually was the first CEO of Charity Navigator. And he's now the CEO of the Eisner Foundation out in Southern California. And we're going to talk with him about his evolution and the work that he's doing now, the work that he's done, because there's a lot in here for you to learn from and benefit from through his experience. And that is Trent Stamp. Trent, welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast. All right. It is a legitimate honor. Thank you for having me. Well, Trent, as I said to you in the uh, waiting room as we were chatting before the podcast, it's been a long time since we talked. But there was a time when we were connected quite a bit as we were both working in our respective organizations to improve the accountability and transparency of charities. And you were at the beginning stages of launching Charity Navigator. Boy, those were the days, huh? <laughs> it was, I mean, it was a fun time. It's its a weird thing for us to, to share in that for a while there, we were two of the only three organizations on earth that were evaluating public charities. We were going at it from different angles and, and different approaches, but we were both trying to do the same thing, which was to shine a light on charitable giving and to help people figure out where they should spend their philanthropic dollars. You had been there before me and you were there long after me, but for a little while there, we were peers or rivals or adversaries or colleagues or whatever you want to say, but we were, uh, we were trying to figure out how best to run organizations that were, uh, were trying to make the world a safer place for charitable donors. And I, I honestly can commend you. A, you were gracious then, and we were, we were brash and we kind of, came at it from a slightly different approach than you certainly were doing at give.org and the Better Business Bureau. But you were you welcomed us into the the sphere, at least publicly. Who knows what you said about us privately, but that's nobody's <laughs> business. But you welcomed us in. And then I cut and run eventually after seven years to try something else. But you have stayed and, and fought the good fight. And I uh, I commend you for that. Well, I'll just say all of what you said is how we viewed you, you know, all of it, because, I mean, I think what you did is uncommon to launch a new organization in the charity monitoring space, which frankly has become one of the largest, if not, it's certainly the largest evaluator of of organizations, according to rating system. You started that, you were the first CEO. I mean, you had a good owner behind you, a good founder who put a lot of money into it, but it was your good work that really launched the organization. I think you guys took some risks and over time they paid off and you deserve a lot of credit for that. So people can call you whatever they want, but, but it worked. <laughs> no, I mean, we were, we were not popular in the sector, but that was okay because that was never our intended audience. We were trying to help the person who was 
in their kitchen and they wanted to give to a animal welfare related organization and they had no idea which one was which, you know as well as I do that there are a fair number of bad actors in the space and there are a fair number of people who are trying to trick donors in some way or another, using misleading names, spending most of their money on fundraising, registering in one state and then fundraising in another state so that they could avoid a local attorney general or a jurisdiction that had a viewpoint on on their activities. And we were just trying to help that particular type of giver. We were never trying to help the giver that was going to give $10,000 10000 or 50000 or $100,000. In fact, we were stunned when people were using our advice to make that kind of gift. We were hopeful that, that perhaps they'd be a little more sophisticated if they were going to give that kind of dollar amount. But people were. But we were really trying to help the, the entry-level giver who was just trying to do something good with their discretionary income, but was quickly overwhelmed by trying to figure out who the organization was if they were trying to support something that wasn't their local church or their local school or their local food bank where they could see the work in their community. So we cut our teeth by being pretty media savvy. We got on TV a lot. Sometimes that's because we were willing to say some audacious things that not everybody wanted to hear at all times. But we were the darling of of a lot of news programs and, and spent a lot of time advocating on behalf of what we thought we should be saying and people picked up on it. And you know, you also have to remember it's it's a time period. We came to prominence right after 9-11 when people picked up their checkbook to try to support organizations and in reality actually probably donated too much money because there wasn't the, the long-term survival and recovery missions that people thought they were given to. And so there were a lot of scammers out there and there were a lot of organizations that didn't know what to do with with the funding that they got. And then 9-11 was quickly followed by Hurricane Katrina and then the tsunami. And so that was, you know, we realized that the world was different, that it wasn't Pearl Harbor anymore. If something horrible happened in the country, people weren't going to run down and mobilize to join the fight. They were going to pick up their credit card and try to make a gift to somebody and they needed help navigating who to give to. So the ground was fertile for the kind of work we do and the kind of work that you still do, but it wasn't going to be my lifelong career. Well, you gave it, I guess, seven years. I gave it seven hard years of charity leaders calling me up and calling (laughs) me names and threatening to beat me up in parking lots. And, uh, you know, uh, it was a it was a young man's game and we went hard. But I think the organization has pivoted since I've left to be kind of more of a, a member of the nonprofit sector. You know, we were modeling ourselves after things like U.S. News or World Report with colleges or even Yelp or those types of things. There were a third party evaluator. And I think Charity Navigator eventually kind of moved over to a model of, of, of working with the charities more than, than we did when we were originally there. We wanted to work with them, but we were an upstart and brand new into the field that we couldn't get anybody to give us any documentation. And we would write them and say, please send us your, your information. And they would say, nope, under no circumstances are we going to give you information. And we're already giving it to art to some degree. And so we had to rely on public documents in 990s. And that was the way that we went about our evaluations. And so they were they were what they were. And I, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we did. I think that we promoted a lot of transparency, a lot of accountability. We got a lot of charities to pay attention to their own financial documents and figure out what they were putting out there into the world and and change some of their practices. And I think we we got some people out of the sector who should never have been in the sector in the first place. And then I think we did guide a lot of really good giving around 9-11 and the tsunami and Hurricane Katrina, where people were trying to, to respond and didn't know what to do. So I'm very proud of the work, but it wasn't it wasn't going to be my lifelong mission. Yeah, well, you've moved on to what has become, I guess, a much longer term commitment now uh, at the Eisner Foundation. Yeah. I've been at the Eisner Foundation in, in Southern California for 16 years now. I never thought that I would be anywhere for, for 16 years, but the work has been interesting. The family has been very generous in their support of us and the organization provided clear leadership and vision and, and allowed us to build this into what it has become. And it's really just been a, a, an opportunity of a lifetime. And I've really enjoyed being on the philanthropic side. So what is the 
Tell me about the family's orientation to the mission. What is it about the family that really makes intergenerational concern so important to them? When I joined the foundation in 2008, Michael Eisner had had recently departed Disney and the foundation had existed for for quite a while before I came, but they really wanted to to pivot and and make a commitment to philanthropy and and make this part of of what they did and, and how they did it. But the foundation was primarily focused on children, which made sense because Michael had been the CEO of the Walt Disney Company. And so he had earned a, a generous income for presiding over the Disney empire. And, and he wanted to philanthropically invest in children's related causes. But, but like I said, when I showed up, he had recently left Disney. And so we started looking around and we, and we asked the question of if we're supporting children because they need advocacy, they need access They can be vulnerable at times and not just because they're cute and they buy plush animals or anything like that. But if we're supporting them because an investment in them will make our society better, don't we have an obligation to do something similar with seniors? A rapidly growing population that oftentimes shares some of those similarities with children, which is, you know, they lack advocacy, they lack access. If you provide them with a safety net, they can be contributing members of society and, and it, it is good for everybody involved. And so for a little while there, we ran a foundation where we had two distinct buckets of giving. We had a children's focus and we had a senior's focus and never the twain shall meet until we started recognizing that the organizations that we really liked the best, the ones that we found to be the most efficient and the most effective were those that were working with children and seniors simultaneously, side by side, treating both groups as resources to serve the other one. The motto of of foster grandparents is every dollar spent twice, because if you invest in an, an older person who can help take care of a younger person, you can serve two groups and serve your community as a whole. And so for the family, as, as the family was getting older, you know, Michael and Jane were, were getting older, their sons and, and daughters-in-law were getting older, and then a new generation of grandchildren were coming along, nine Eisner grandchildren. It just made sense logistically. It made sense that the foundation should be intergenerational and we should invest intergenerationally. So we decided to exclusively fund those organizations that worked intergenerationally, that treated the two groups, older folks and younger people, as assets and resources that can be utilized to benefit not only each other, but society as a whole. So so what does that mean? For us, it's funding a lot of groups that do mentoring, obviously, that do tutoring, kind of bringing people together to, to help the other one. It's a lot of shared sites, which are things like preschools inside senior centers or senior housing on a college campus, those types of things that used to be age divided and age segregated, but they're finding great benefits if you can bring the two groups together for the betterment of the institution. We do a lot of work around grandparents as parents, folks who are parenting their own grandchildren and need help trying to figure out how to navigate the system? Should they adopt? What's that do to their benefits? How do they figure out the court system? How do they figure out the school system? Because they're usually parenting their grandchildren for not a great reason, right? It's not optimal. They're doing it because that middle generation has been removed for some reason and is unable to parent their own children. And then the other thing that we're we're doing a fair amount of is intergenerational art. We have an intergenerational orchestra that we fund and an intergenerational big band, an intergenerational choir where older folks and younger folks literally have to get on the same page, find the same note and try to create something that is bigger than the two of them by figuring out what is your place in the circle there and learn from each other and tutor each other and mentor each other and come together in in Los Angeles or New York City, the two communities in which we work, and create music for the community as a whole. So we're just looking to bring people together. We think older people are resources to be treasured. We think kids need help and access and have a lot to give if we can invest in them. And we really like to work with intergenerational programs that serve both groups. Wow. I mean, that's a long way from a charity monitor. 
have to say. <laughs> it, it was a bit of a shift. Our, you know, <laughs> like we are all about healthy aging and figuring out how to address what you know the demographers disparagingly call the silver tsunami of an exploding older population. And, and we like to think that there's a way to figure out how to make this a good thing and not to be doom scrolling towards all these old people are coming to take these young people's money and, and Social Security is going to rob us of zero to three funding. There's got to be a better way. And we want to live in a society where we, we try to bring people together and, and try to treasure multiple generations. Yeah. Well, you know, older people are choosing to stay in the workplace more now, too. I think that may, for some people, create some tensions at least in the generations just prior, because the feeling is that you have the job that I should be in now. But we're going to be living longer. Many of us will outlive our pensions. And so we have to work. You know, nobody's trying not to. And and, and more importantly, I think we feel that we can be productive. I know I do. And I don't see that there's a need to stop working just so I can play more golf. I like playing golf, but I like what I do. I like being able to contribute. I think there are lots of people in that age group who also feel that way. I also enjoy spending time with my five grandchildren and sharing what I can with them. And so I can clearly see this link, this relationship between the young and the old. And I would imagine those in between to some extent, too, who help enable a lot of this either because they need the support of younger or older people, or they just believe that it's a great way to share a legacy. So I just, I I love this idea. And uh, I think it's brilliant that you all have come up with this, not only as something that sounds right, but also there's some demonstrated economic value to it and societal value to it. Well, I I think an important thing that you touched on there, Art, is that with with all due respect, you're good at your job. So why would we want to send you out to the golf course where I don't know whether you're any good or not? You and I have never played together, but it's good for society to keep you in the workforce. You're working, you're contributing. I know you take very seriously your opportunities to mentor younger people. And it, it's better for us if we can figure out a way. And I just, I'm not into this zero sum game where art has to go so that my daughter can come into your organization and take your job. I think we can do better than that. I think we can aspire to a multi generational workforce. And maybe as you get older, you're not going to want to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. But there are serious things that you can bring to the organization and bring to the culture, especially as we get more divided as a society and get more people from working from home and and staring at a screen all day long. We have to find ways to, to restore that fabric in some way or another. And I just think that investing in, in keeping you in the workforce and, and others like you uh, not just you particularly, Art. I'm not going to just yeah. chain you to a desk forever. <laughs> it's good for us, and it's it's good for our community, and, and I just think we have to find better ways to address these types of things. And now it's time for our Giving Tips segment with Bennett Weiner, one of the world's most renowned experts on charity accountability and the COO of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance. Today, I'd like to talk about donating to animal welfare charities. You know, of all the types of organizations that we report on, donors to animal welfare organizations are probably one of the most passionate who really care about their cause and are interested in helping out any way they can. But there are some things that people should still consider when they're trying to choose who to give to. And the first and obvious one is, you know, don't assume what the organization does based on the name alone. You know, animal welfare organizations do different things. Some may be focused on spay and neutering. Some may be focused on adoption. Some may be focused on rescue for animals in, in, in certain situations and so forth and so on. So the name may not necessarily reveal what they're about. Go to the charity's website if you don't know them 
and learn more about what their activities are. The other thing is I would see very often the animal welfare charities, especially some of them are encouraging monthly donations as opposed to one-time gifts. And you can understand why some of them would want to focus on that, but that's still a choice for you as a donor. If you want to make a, a single gift, go right ahead and do that. But if you're going to have a month-to-month, beware that that's going to show up on your credit card, for example, on a monthly basis so, so you're aware of what happens when the bill arrives. So another consideration is... Find out where the animal welfare organization's activities are taking place. Some of them are really focused and confined to a specific area. Others may be statewide or national in scope. You really have to look carefully so you understand how they're going about their work, because that may be an important consideration in your gifts as well. The other thing on on animal welfare, I would say, is that some of the organizations, of course, meet our standards and some don't. So go to give.org to find out if the charity is BBB accredited in terms of meeting the 20 standards that we have for charitable accountability. A friend of mine by the name of Michael Clinton, who used to be an executive at Hearst, he one time he was publisher of GQ and some other really popular magazines run by that organization. He was a student of mine at Columbia, and uh, he retired from Hearst. I shouldn't say retired. He wouldn't like that word because he's doing anything but retiring. But he started another business. Hearst is partnering with him on it to deal with this whole question of people past 50 and how they can create their second, third, or even fourth acts in some cases. And he's bringing a lot of attention to this issue. But I don't think anyone has quite connected the young people to it the way that you have, which is so interesting to me. Because again, we're not young. We still have vitality. We still have things to do, but there's some things that are best left to the young. Sure. And what if we could find these ways of connecting and not only mentoring, have the old folk mentoring them, but have the young people mentoring us too, because I think that there are skills and abilities in this new digital age that we can learn from each other. And so this may be something that goes even beyond what you and your founders are trying to do. If we can connect these generations, it will definitely enrich the lives of people across all generations. And it will create greater opportunities. Because you know, Trent, I have to tell you, I'm doing things today, and I'm sure you may be too, that I would never have dreamed that I'd be doing today. I wouldn't, if you'd have told me I'd be doing a weekly podcast where I'm interviewing charity executives, I would never have dreamed that I'd be doing that. But I've been able to evolve because I've seen what's happening in the marketplace and in the environment, and that's calling for that. And in doing that, I've learned a lot from younger people who are much more nimble than I am on technologies And it's made a difference in how I'm able to stand up. And I can see years from now, maybe I'll be doing something completely different than what I'm doing now because my skills continue to evolve. So that is the beauty of this. And I love that you said, we don't want to keep you chained to this desk, but maybe I'm not the CEO in my next job. Maybe I'm just a regular worker in my next job who's being led by a younger person. And I'm learning to be supportive of what they're trying to do. So I think there's opportunities if we're all open to it. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think at at the root of it is that ageism is, is one of those, it may be the last remaining socially permissible ism Mm -hmm. that allows us to see people of of different ages as, as other. Yeah. We see it all the time. I mean, you know, you see the, you see it today in the newspaper. Is Joe Biden too old to be president? All right. You wouldn't say, I don't know, is Nikki Haley too much of a woman to be president? I mean, it's, it's absurd, right. but we, we still right. find comfort in kind of otherizing older people. And yeah. it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense. It should be about competence. It should be about wisdom. It should be about what you can bring to the table. I have a I have a 22 year old daughter who's about to enter the workforce. She's graduating next month from from college and and she's going to go out there and any employer who's looking to hire her knows full well that she's bright. She has a lot to offer, 
but she's going to have to be trained. There are things that you're going to have to teach her to make her be a, a competent and, and productive member of your company. But yet I hear corporations all the time saying, I don't want to hire older people because I will have to train them in a particular technology. You're willing to train my daughter to teach her how to do expense reports and how to wear the right clothes to work and how to work the copy machine and how to be professional in a meeting, but you don't want to train Art Taylor or Trent Stamp on, on how to work your software. That That's just crazy. I, I don't know why we allow that to happen <laughs> because Art and Trent are bringing some serious assets to their organization. There's a lot of things that you and I know after a lifetime of work that will benefit the group in a way that some of the things that my daughter brings to the organization will benefit the group. But she has strengths and weaknesses just like you and I do. And so we just we're trying to get people to to look at the quality of individuals and see everybody as resources, as assets to be treasured, as people to be invested in and not just you go sit in the corner over there because we're done with you in society. It's just it's just dangerous. And like you said, we've, we've got an exploding demographic. We've got more people over the age of 60 than under the age of 18 for the first time in American history. And they're going to live longer. They're going to live healthier. They're going to work longer. And we can see it as an opportunity or we can see it as something that should scare us. And we'd like to see it as an opportunity. And so that's what guides all of our philanthropy is trying to figure out what to do with that asset, which is a a wise and older workforce that can be utilized for the benefit of young people who, let's be honest, there's a lot of young people in this country who need some help. We haven't done a great job with all the young people here, giving them the things they need to succeed. And why wouldn't we take this high quality resource of older people who have a lot to give and put them to work on behalf of those young children? Agree. So what are some of the exciting things you guys are funding? Well, we love our, our, our music programs. We love the intergenerational orchestras and big bands and, and, and choirs. We love when you can put a, a preschool inside a senior center. We love when you can put senior housing on a, on a college campus. We've funded a lot of organizations where older adults are going back into the classrooms, back into the schools, back into youth organizations and serving as as mentors, as coaches, as tutors, as teachers even, trying to figure out how best to deal with this grandparents as parents issue and give them the resources they need to navigate the system and give those kids the the thing that they deserve. And then we're really into just this idea of, of the workforce development, which is what do we do with older workers? How do we arm them with the tools they need so that they can better work primarily in nonprofits and primarily working with children? We're not necessarily just trying to train you to be a better employee for Deloitte and Touche for another 10 years. That's on Deloitte and Touche to do that. But if you're 60 years old and you've had a career and working for special effects in the movie industry or working in software for Intel or or those types of things, and you want to go back and help nonprofits that work with young kids, strengthening, teaching them how to better enter the sector, we want to talk to those types of organizations. And so we've done a lot of funding in that area. Fantastic. Trent, I know that you have done this for now, you said 16 years. What's kept you in this work? And I won't just add the 16 at Eisner, but also the seven at Charity Navigator. That has given you a long run in the nonprofit sector. What's kept you in this in this sector? Yeah, you know, I did two years as a Teach for America teacher before that, and then another two years working in, in national headquarters for Teach for America. So Um, I've never really left the nonprofit sector. This has been what I have done. Um, I've taught nonprofit management at at USC. And so my entire career has essentially been in the nonprofit world, either as a direct service provider or as a charity evaluator or now on the philanthropic side. So I've seen the sector from every single side. And the thing that's kept me in it is the work. It's an opportunity to do better. It's an opportunity to help our fellow man and woman and child in every way whatsoever. But it's an opportunity to be a part of the solution and to be optimistic about the future. So I see good things in this country. Of course, we see bad things sometimes, too. I'm I'm optimistic about young people. 
and I just want to be a part of the solution. I couldn't get out of bed every morning if it was going to to make that widget. I know we need the widgets, but it's just it's not what you do for a living art. It's not what I do for a living. It's not what a lot of young people have done for a long time. We, we only have so much, only so much milk in the bucket. I would like to put mine to work on the side of, of trying to make things better for those who deserve the opportunity and the access. So it's been my life's calling and it's been a privilege that I've been able to do the work I want to do and still be able to provide for my family and, and be part of the community and send my kids to college and all those types of things. So I've been very, very lucky. I'm, I'm not leaving the nonprofit sector anytime soon. I don't plan on leaving the Eisner Foundation, but I'm certainly not leaving the sector because I find the quality of people here and the purpose in the sector to be something that should be celebrated. I know when I was running Charity Navigator, not everybody thought that I felt that way about the nonprofit sector. There were a lot of nonprofit CEOs that thought that I was not there to to celebrate their work. But I always felt like if I could help shine a light on those that were not being helpful, that would allow those who were really doing good work to have a clearer path to success and a better runway for, for doing very important work. Very true. So here's my last two questions. Yes. You have this executive, they're 55 and they're about ready to leave their company, but they don't know what they want to do next, right? They don't know. They know they're not one on golf. They're probably getting some requests to join some corporate boards or something. How do you tell them to fit the nonprofit work into their next chapter, number one? Number two, we have this crisis, Trent. We're not giving to organizations. Families aren't giving to organizations, and we've seen the numbers decline. What do we do in our culture to make it appealing to younger people to give and volunteer in organizations? Okay. For the 55-year-old, which, you know, good for him or her, because they somehow or another were able to get out at 55. They must have done something right along the way. They did something I didn't do. <laughs> yeah, they, they, me neither, Art. So, you know, I wish you the best. But yes, I do think that that person can start slowly, which is just go down and volunteer. I'm not saying you have to go take over an organization or spend all your time, but find an organization in your community that you respect, whether it be a school or a church, homeless shelter, an environmental cleanup organization, whatever it may be. And I think that if you do that and you get to a good organization, you'll get the bug. We see out here, we're funders of CASA, which is the organization that court appointed special advocates where kids who are in the judicial system for some reason or another, whether they've, they've screwed up in some way or another, or they're just embroiled in a, in a custody or a parental issue of some sort or whatever, they provide them with an advocate for them a volunteer whose job it is to speak on behalf of the child and to mentor the child because the child is the one that's not represented in the system on a regular basis. And and we find that those people, by volunteering in the child welfare system, they see how those kids are at a structural disadvantage, which is often different from their own life experience. And that changes their whole perspective. It changes how they vote. It changes how they live. It changes what they want out of life. It changes how they look at their own children and they realize just how lucky and blessed they were because they could have ended up embroiled in such a situation also. So just getting into the process, give an organization an hour and see what happens. You know, if you're 55 and you have enough money and you want to step out, I'm not saying you have to transition over completely to running your local food bank, but give them some time and, and see what happens because they will treasure you. You have something to offer. The days of, of senior volunteers Licking envelopes is long gone. Good organizations recognize that you are a treasure. You have something to offer and they're going to put you to work. And they're probably going to put you to work to the point where you're going to have to hold your hand up and say, I can't take anymore because they, they need you. So so go down and help and then see what happens. We've seen a lot of people who dip their toe in and say, I want to volunteer. I want to be a big brother. I want to coach Little League. I want to mentor in the schools. And the next thing you know, they're working 30 hours a week as a part-time development director because they know how to work the system and they can write good letters and they can make good phone calls and they're, and they're doing the kind of work that their professional training has prepared them for. So, but, but give somebody an hour and see what happens. In terms of, of giving, I, I'm with you. I see the data the same as you do. 
we have a very strange dynamics that's going to happen here in society, or it's already happening, which is we have the largest institutional transfer of wealth that we have ever seen in the United States of America. We're about to hand literally trillions of dollars from one generation to another through inheritance, but the generation that we're handing the money to has, for the most part, a large distrust of institutions. They don't go to church as much. They don't give to their college. They don't give back to their schools. And they have kind of on both sides of the aisle, they have a distrust of the system in some way or another, oftentimes for different reasons. And so what does that mean? We're, it's it, it's going to be a bunch of, of pretty wealthy young people who don't want to respond philanthropically in the way that you and I thought you were supposed to respond philanthropically, which was give to the Red Cross, um, give to our community foundation, be a part of, of this area. So I'm concerned as you are, but I, I just have to stay consistent to the mission and, and to this game, which is I'm optimistic about young people. And they give in different ways. If you see the GoFundMe stuff, it's up dramatically. If you see those types of online giving platforms or individual things, they like stories. They like being part of that type of thing. But I'm concerned, but I also like to think that this is a this is an empathetic generation coming up. They're not cut like we are. They don't have hatred in their hearts in a lot of cases. And they're trying to figure out a better way, but they're they're distrustful of some of the systems that have been handed to them. So I think that they're going to get there. It's just not going to look like it looked like when we were doing it. They're not going to support the Salvation Army like organizations like people used to do. So just to stay consistent, you know, I know I'm rambling here, but just to stay consistent, I think if we can get them to volunteer in the organizations also, then I think that they're more likely in the long run to recognize that our differences are not as big as we think and that we have a lot in common and that people just need a help and, and maybe they'd be more inclined to give and to participate in some way or another if we can get them out there and to see some of the inequality that exists, but also that that inequality can be addressed by doing some high quality volunteering. Yeah. Well, you, you make a lot of good points here. And I can tell you the good news is that charities see it. They understand the issue and they're trying to figure out how to address it, how to do it, how to make a dent in the culture so that people don't look at institutions as somehow different than they used to be. Because I don't think they are. I just think that we know more about them now. <laughs> you know, we can, there's a lot more transparency around what actually goes on. And so people begin to question when they see things that they didn't question when they didn't see it. And so hopefully over time, people, even those who don't believe in institutions at all, will come to see the utility and the, and the value in them. And I, I think, Trent, having those kinds of resources will align you with institutions of some kind because, you know, you just can't hold on to that amount of money and put it under your mattress, right? It's, it's got to go somewhere and it's got to go to people who you trust, even if you're investing it. Well, look, I, Trent, I really appreciate this. It's been great catching up with you after all these years. I'm so happy to see that you've landed at a place that is providing you with the kind of meaningful engagement, meaningful work that you've landed on here. It's obviously important that we find ways to connect these generations because there's a lot to be gained. And what a better person to have doing that work along with the founder, Michael Eisner, and his family than you. So I'm really happy for you, and I'm really grateful that you found the time to check in with me. And, and let's not make it another, what was it, 15, 16 years since we talked. It's got to be 16 years, you know. We, 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 <laughs> talked, we talked a fair amount back in the day when we were you know, the two big fish in the world's yep. smallest pond. Yep. <laughs> I realized there wasn't enough room in the pond for me and you, and you're still there, and uh, you own the pond. No, I don't know about all that. And you have done such amazing work on behalf of charitable givers. 
we're all thankful for for what you've done at, at give.org on behalf of the BBB. And so I want to thank you, Art, for your career, for your mentoring, for the role you've played in, in so many young people's lives, and, and for the fact that you were just kind and generous to me when I was running Charity Navigator back in the day. Yes, I'm happy to do the work that we can do at the Eisner Foundation and try to figure out ways to to bridge some of these divides that we have in society because we don't have any choice, right? I mean, we got to figure it out. And so we're going to continue to do our work. And I thank you for doing your work. And it's been an honor to be on your uh, your podcast today. Well, thank you. And to all of those who are listening for the first time, I want you to know that this is the Heart of Giving podcast. It's a weekly show. It comes out every Tuesday. And I hope you will subscribe because that's how we build the the audience for the show by people subscribing and also sharing the news about the show to other friends and colleagues. And so we'll see you back here again next week. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.